I need this one right in my veins. If you like what you see here, guys, make sure you subscribe at the end and make sure you check for the links to see even more videos because we've got one hell of a badass match here. You know, you guys usually like it when there's like one relatable player in the thumbnail or in the title. When there's two, y'all go crazy. So I really want to know, what will you all do if I give you six? Yeah, you heard me right. That's right. We are back. But this time, not with a 1v1. It is going to be a 3v3. And look at the names. The star started lineup. We have got a $150 show match going on here between Kapoch, Marine Lord, Vortex, Mr. Lucifron, and Hera. Yeah, you heard me right. We, we got the star studded. For those that are not familiar with the current rankings on the leaderboard, that is one, two, three, three players in the top 10 who between them, I believe, own half of the spots in the top 10. Yeah, you heard that right. And then the remaining players have been in the top 10 or close to before. Hera currently sitting 26. The Mister, I believe, has slid down a little bit, is sitting in 50th at the moment. And then rounding out Kapoch. Kapoch has two accounts, one being 19th and the other being 41st. So this is a top 50 player lobby, six of them, and I am excited. Teams for those one ranks are going to be Kapoch, Marine Lord, and Hera versus Lucifron, Mister, and Vortex. And that's exciting to me. It means the bros are playing together, right? And you have to you have to consider that fact of who's been playing with who a lot before, right? I'm not sure how much Kapoch and Hera played together in their AoE two days, so maybe that's a variable to consider. But of course, Lucifer and Vortex, they're, they're bros. They've been around each other their whole life. They've been playing games together for years and years. They've been learning from each other for years and years. So they maybe have that kind of deeper like understanding, that link up that maybe makes them a bit quicker to make kind of crucial decisions in the, in the game that can make the difference. Civilized, we are going to have Kapoch on England and Marino is going to be man in the Roos. And running out for the team one is going to be Hera on the French. So potential for some feudal age aggression there. I don't expect too much before that point in the game. Meanwhile, when you look at team two, they've got a Mongol, a French player, and a Chinese. So they could get aggressive immediately at the start of feudal. They could also look to just boom up to castle. I think either one works. And I think something that a lot of people forget is the economical benefits surrounding the Mongols. Like they're actually an incredibly effective sieve at scaling quickly into castle and then booming at that point in the game. Early on, we are just going to see the Khan causing some frustration for Kapoch as he's trying to gather the required gold for the tech up. Looks like he should be able to get required amount. And then this is probably the worst player to do it to just because England isn't going to necessarily have to come back onto the gold line anytime soon, right? For England, they can just hang around in feudal for a little bit. And apparently these are the teams for the Prime Cup in January. Is that correct? I'm just double checking that now. Bear with me a sec, guys. I didn't realize they'd announced a new Prime Cup. Had they? I, I can't see the details of that. So if someone has it, be sure to link in the chat. I always appreciate you guys. But this is exciting nonetheless. Like, I, I think we had, just the other day, we got to see all the Gamer Legion guys playing a charity event against each other, and that was kind of clown fiesta in some ways, but also entertaining. But this uh, this has money on the line, right? That's the difference. The other one was kind of like an entertaining thing that you could like, see the friendship between and they're having a good time. This one, it's Mune. Mune on the line, all right? Mula to play for. So we're actually going to see some serious builds, some serious approaches. I don't necessarily see, expect to see an all-in strap. I think the problem with... Age of Empires maps is they're too big to easily necessitate uh, these very cheesy all-in strats. Let's say, for example, an absolute player was in this game. I don't necessarily think we'd see a ram rush, especially since they're the ram nerfs, like you might cheesily ha happen to you in a 4v4. Ah, okay, there we go. Uh, thank you, chat. I, I thought someone was wrong there. So it's the AV4 Prime League. Oh, sorry, not Prime League, the Pro League. Is that the one, I believe... Who was behind that? I think it was... Yeah, it was Lidicor. Shout out to Lidicor, by the way, for bringing more tournaments to the scene. Always nice to see people, content creators, with a decent following and some money back in them actually putting it back into the scene like this. So, Kind of excited to see what other teams are going to <laughs> appear as time goes on with this. As uh, For those unfamiliar, the AOE4 Pro League is the 3v3 event that I think is about midway through January. Yeah, it starts on the 13th of January. So keep an eye out for that. And uh, shout out to Lidical again for hosting that.
botch is going to be the first one to get tech up, despite the pr uh, the actual pressure on him from the Mongol player at the beginning of the match. And I wonder, is there a rule in place for this match? I'd have to check the rule set because one thing I have noticed is there's no same Civ, right? Like there is two French players in this game, but they're on different teams. I wonder if that's a condition because one thing to think about here, we said about those cheesy elements. One cheesy element that maybe doesn't hurt you much is imagine if um, a team went all Mongols and they just ran all of their Khans across to one base. And even with that pitiful damage early on, two damage, right? You could snipe out one or two villages quickly. You could actually put a, one of your opponents in an uncomfortable situation and not sacrifice anything yourself. Would be a little bit risky. Would be very all in. Might not have much fullback. Might be easy to counter you. But it's something to think about that maybe we end up seeing in the tournament if there's not a rule against it. So opening wise, Luciferon did go into School of Cavalry. I, I'm looking for any deviations. I don't really expect to see any here. School of Cavalry is way too good in these type of maps. Like there's no real value in going for your trade option uh, because all those marketplaces here, it could be very hard to defend these. The only situation I expect to see maybe a marketplace come out is from Vortex. And there it is. Yeah, Silver Tree. Silver Tree is just justifiable because of this, right? You scale up much quicker than a French player would, courtesy of the fact that you produce your set every 17 seconds and you're able to double the production courtesy of the Uzi, right? Also, they cost less gold. So all of that adds up to a more beneficial situation where you can actually quickly get up to a point where you're scaling quickly into Castle Age and then between your opponents, you can guard. And the other detail that allows them to do this, by the way, is the fact that Vortex is the central player. So he's unlikely to come under as much pressure. I think this is a, a fairly optimal strategy when you're playing 3v3s. The central player should receive less pressure in the early mid game. So they're the one that should be able to tech boom, right? Or be more greedy, do whatever, whatever greedy thing you want to do. That, that, so, say you want to have a Delhi player on your side, probably should be the center player. You want to have a Mongol player on your side. I, it can be a flank player. I actually like it when it's a center player just because it has options with the silver tree. And let's say you've got a Roost player who doesn't want to be involved in the early game at all, right? Like, there's a Roost player in this game. It's actually Marine Lord over here. He might not build a single military unit. He might just be going for the Castle Age rush. He can get away with it, even on the flank, because of how quick this Civ does it and how big these 3v3 maps are like we talked about before. I haven't checked in on China recently. Whoa. Okay, Lucifron wastes no time at all. I don't think he's dropped a Barbican yet. No, I would love to see him save the Barbican of Sun and drop it aggressively next to an opponent's base. That could be a cool strategy to utilize here. Uh, because remember, if he goes for Barbican of Sun, he gets both of the Pudal Age landmarks. He'll get access to the Song Dynasty, which will give him a 35% reduction on time to build villages, bringing him down to 13 seconds, I believe it is. But right now, he's competitive like this. He's going to get decent gains. One thing I will say, by the way, is being in games like this, you can see how important it is that we get our hands soon on a, uh, a more options in the Spectre. I'd love to have one to just see the village account, the population breakdown, because otherwise we have to cycle through all these different saves. Whoa, by the way, did you guys just notice that small detail? Marine Lord's already unlocked all three tiers of his bounty system. Not that hard of a feat on the map this big, mind you. Remember that there's 12 deer points on the map when you play in 3v3s, and there's only one Roost player involved in this. So while there are three players trying to sabotage you, there's two that will happily leave the deer for you. So overall, I did expect him to hit this number, but still good that he got it this quick. That allows you to get the Castle Age even quicker, as we're now seeing. In fact, Marine Lord should easily be the first person to crack it with what's going to be about an 8 minute 30 Castle Age timing. An aggression... In the north. Horseman coming out, but nice composition. Hera supporting with the knights. And then the longbowman can move in as a result. Because right now, they're not counted in any way. Everything here does not counter out knights. That's a problem right now for Team 2. And they need to solve it soon. And here it is. Missed up. Arrives with his own knights. And he has plenty more. Hera, where's the count right now? How are you this far behind? He's pushing them out now with two more stables drop. But it looks like he gets, he gets beaten to the punchline by Mister here. Mister already in place. They can chase down the Longbowman. Longbowman that move insanely slow. And there we go. Tech up is complete as Marine Lord reaches to the sky. And gets that pre nine minute castle age timing. Wrap around from the Horseman. Sticking on top of the Archer still. Being sniped out one by one. But notice they completely ignore the Knights because the value they can find is in sniping Horseman. Remember, only two arrow resistance compared to three and less health. And it looks like in the end, they might have to back off here. They still have the knight number advantage, but remember that it takes a longer time for Mister to reinforce this fight than it does for Hera, as Hera is much closer. Yeah. 
And is anyone else close to the tech up margin here? I don't think so. It looks like we're going to see a lot of these sieves hanging around in the feudal for the time being. Marine Lord will be able to ramp up aggression, and he should dictate the flow now with his horse archers pushing out. I think this is where it gets risky for Team 2. The fact that this castle has just achieved this quickly and they're still scaling up the, the trade route, right? They haven't even got all the outposts down to speed this up yet. It means that Vortex isn't ready to play for a few more minutes at least. He's got a small contingent of archers, but it's going to be moot in the grand scheme of things at this rate. He needs an extra five, six, maybe seven minutes before aggression comes in. And you see Marine Lord is not waiting around. He moves in with the horse archers already. Can't find a way in just yet. In the meantime, Carcass is being picked up by Hera. Really, another kind of nice cross-pollination. This is what I love to see when you get these different sieves. Also, it, it kind of bridges off from that point we talked about earlier about everyone spamming Mongols or Rus or whatever. If you do that, you step on each other's toes for different reasons. And this is one example of how you can be very synergetic, right? So for a start, Marine Lord, he'll kill all the the deer all over the place and they'll collect some of them. The other half can go to Hera because he's playing as France. That's like a tier two uh, pro scout sieve because of course they get access to scouts production straight out of their fuel landmark and also they produce them 20% quicker. And then also keep in mind that the other player on your team is England. So he has no use for pro scouts. England players don't do this. Instead, they'll opt for sheep, berries, and then they'll go straight into farmlands. So it's a nice kind of composite, right? It, you don't really tread on each other's toes too much. Meanwhile, on the other side, Lucifron, he would have that flexibility to go into Pro Scouts if he so choose, which he didn't. And then you've got the Mongols that would probably quite happily do Pro Scouts, but because it's a trade route game, he doesn't need that. He just needs pastures. And then finally, it's another French player who can now gather all of those carcasses as he chooses, because once again, as we said, it's a Tier 2 Pro Scout sieve. And it looks like Mister is ready for a tech up. Right, we'll begin. It's going to be the guild hall. This could be a big edge. Hera's nowhere near either. That's a problem I see right now. So Hera, he's trying to match the pace of the night production, right? The problem is Mr. chose to slow down his night production, and now he's going to get quality over quantity. And he needs some solution, because he understands that he's banked right next to Marine Lord, who is the horse archer spammer in this game. So he's going to need some sort of advantage to defend himself. Especially considering that if you allow these horse archers through, look what they're going to find. They're trying to move in now to snipe out Vortex's caravans. They understand that a Mongol player on a map this big, and they haven't seen any Yam yet, would suggest that this Mongol player is in fact playing a greedy trade uh, economy. And they'd be right. Very greedy expansions by Lucifron. I see this a lot more with the biggest maps. Pocket economies, because... Getting ample defenses in location can be wonky. Staying in one area can be rough because of how long the games can go. You want to give yourself that scalability in a fullback position. And also, it's much harder to punish these pocket economies just because of how vast the map is, right? Think how long it would take even for cavalry to run across this map. It's no small feat. Speaking of big feet, big hooves, in fact, on these horses. As Hera has got a lot of knights. He'll see the tech up news from Mista, but they haven't been scaled up yet. So he does have the number of fights and he will engage. Longbowmen holding their own, but being sniped from both sides. The Zhugnu pinching them between the archer line and themselves. And the Zhugnu will run through most of the Longbowmen, but they are being sniped in the back by the Royal Knights. With the Baron Ram alive, the Baron Ram could do some damage to the Chinese base if it so chooses. Instead, it looks like it wants to be involved in the party. It's Kapochis, for some reason, I don't know what he's doing with the Baron Ram. He's moving to places, guys. It's a, it's a tour. It's a tour of the Chinese base. So after that, I, I think if your team won, you're really happy. That was two players versus three players, and you killed more of them. Like, night count is very much now in your favor. Lombo survived very well there, despite the fact they were against Zhugnu. And we're seeing kind of the wonkiness of Zhugnu sometimes, right? They're not as amazing as you actually expect, because although once they're in range, they can stick some damage, they have a small health pool so they can get sniped out themselves by things like the Knights. And also, they can't chase down. They have the same movement speed, 1.12 tiles per second. So if the Longbowmen ever pull away, the Longbowmen actually will get several volleys off before you gap close. And that can just turn the fight entirely. Meanwhile, in the south, Marine Lord, he found the trade route. Oh, Vortex. This is going to be his game pretty much done if he loses most of these. He needs a way of defending this. He hasn't really got that scalable economy right now. And he's in the middle of a tech up, the Cruelty. The Cruelty that is a very wonky investment on this map, but something we see players engage with because you are playing on a 3v3 map, right? 
And while step readout might seem conceptually great, in this situation, because you went Silver Tree, Kurotai just is the default option. It's just so good. Your trade should be providing all the gold you need. Now you're in a situation where you wish you probably went for the step readout because you're not going to get trade anymore because of the Horse Archer spam. Second TC in the meantime is coming out from Mr. Trying to scale himself up. Meanwhile, Team 1 want to try and kill a player off. They did force Lucifron to bank the Barb and the Sun in the base. That is giving him a quicker villager production rate. So there's so many troops here for them to get through. You see that Botch is heavily investing in these Longbowmen and these Baron Rams. No intent of teching up himself. Only him and Lucifron remain on that tech up front. And Lucifron, understandably, staying in this point in the game to scale up. And this is maybe the downside of them, right? Think about this logically. Although there was a greedy player on Team 1 with Marine Lord, the greed was quick and it was done with and now it scales. Meanwhile, because of the way Lucifron's built and the way that Vortex is built, and, I, and it's almost like you can tell their brothers, they're the greedy boys in this situation. What they're doing pays off in 10 minutes time. It doesn't pay now. And that puts overwhelming pressure on Mister to defend them. And what has Mister now got, gone and done? He's dropped a second TC. So he's being a greedy boy himself. And although it's a big map, this greed can only serve you so long. And they might be in trouble. Here right now to 21 knights. They are the vet ones, so they outnumber Mister. This greed factor of 10 is about to turn into a fat zero on the final score for Team 2. You can say that again. How many horse arches? 42. I, I Maybe if you had some Maganels, but... Uh, well, the homeboy's home base is still a feudal, so Lucifron can't provide those on the front. And so many villagers are going to get sniped out here. They run straight in. Baron Ram's coming in as well. Knights join in. TC expansion is going to fall very soon. No way the villagers can keep this up either. And Lucifron, his greed, his failure to field an army that makes sense, only being able to go for Shugnu in this situation against the armored knights is going to backfire entirely upon him. That's one TC down. They'll be forced to engage. They cannot back off here or they will lose Lucifron. His landmarks will die so fast. In fact, they're already sniping out the Imperial Academy as we speak. And this Nightline is holding Hera. He reached the critical mass. They can't even breach past him. The Zhuknu now had to fight on their own against the Longbowmen and the Horse Archers. And even after that, Hera, he'll be able to actually 1v2 on the right side here and run through the remaining troops. It looks like this game is all but done. And with the Imperial Academy in flames, so too are the hopes of Team 2. They are all but out of this one. Yeah, Lucifron surrenders over. No way he can remain in. For some reason, Mister refuses to give up, but this is over. GG is going to be called. Hera, Marine Lord, and Kapoch will take it in this 3v3.